Hi and welcome back to a new video today again 12900K topic well generally the 12th gen Intel topic we will talk about overclocking the CPUs and more about the platform in general how the clocks work together how the voltages are set up and all this type of stuff because just judging from the comments in my previous videos there sometimes seem to be some things which were not that clear to everyone so we will just make sure that everybody will be on the same level. Our today's setup will be the MSI MEG Unify X C690 board which is pretty much the overclocking high-end board from MSI and what I really like about this board is that it doesn't use any kind of RGB which makes this probably the best board for any kind of very clean non-RGB builds if you pair it with something something like this the Vention sticks without RGB unfortunately those are not my highest performing DDR5 sticks those are the Platinum sticks with uh, 5200C36, that's why I have to use them, that's why they're using RGB, but it doesn't really matter. Anyway, the board is very, very strong. It only uses one DIMM per channel, which means that you can only have two memory sticks in total. But since DDR5 offers very high capacity per stick, that shouldn't really be an issue. Should be no issue whatsoever for DDR5 to get 64 gigabyte or even 128 gigabyte for desktop memory with two sticks. And with just two sticks, you can probably get the highest bandwidth or highest clocks on the memory dims. One thing I have to add is the cooling aspect. And I would, I would absolutely recommend that you would at least go for a 360 AIO, what we have in today's guide as well. You can also use the 12900K or 12600K with air cooling units. That's no issue whatsoever, but it depends what you want to do with it. If you just want to use it for gaming, then typically your load will be somewhere between 120 to 150 watt. And a good air cooling unit can easily handle that. But if you're looking for very high overclocks and want to run some Cinebench runs, then you easily hit the region of 240 to 250 watt. And that's the region where you at least usually need a 360 AIO or even better, if possible, custom water cooling. If you don't have that, then usually overclocking the 12900K doesn't really make much sense because you're instantly hitting the thermal limit. The Unify X features a very beefy VRM similar to probably all the other C690 boards. It's 19 plus two phases. We will later look at the VRM temperature after we performed our overclocking. But my experience so far from like the early access to C690 boards is that we don't have to worry about any of the boards when it comes to like VRM stability, VRM temperatures. For this guide, I will try to keep things as simple as possible, even though the 12900K or the 12th gen Intel CPUs in general offer very, very much tuning potential, not in terms of raw clocks, but in terms of options, you have to fine tune the CPU. But 99.99999 percent of these options are not relevant for any of you. Even for extreme overclocking, most of them don't help or they only help in a very, very specific scenario. So I will leave out a lot of stuff which is simply not necessary and might just lead to additional confusion. If you look at the image or at the slide you can see right now, on the left side, very simplified the main board with the VRM and on the right side you can see the CPU. And the first voltage we're looking at is the core voltage vCore, however you want to call this. The official name should be VCCIA, that's the Intel architecture voltage. And this is somewhere between 1.05 to 1.4 volts, depending on the load scenario of the CPU, depending on the overclocking state, depending on uh, the core configuration, a lot of different factors go into that. And this voltage powers the P cores, the E cores, so the big cores and the small cores, and also the ring. The ring is the bus that connects everything inside the CPU, is often also called the cache voltage. And now there's this thing which makes the 12900K a bit special comparing it to previous gen CPUs. For example, the 9900K or 10900K would just receive this core voltage from the mainboard VRM and then it's fed to the CPU and that's it. In the past there were also other CPUs, for example the 4790K, which featured a fiber, a fully integrated voltage regulator, which meant that a part of the VRM was moved from the mainboard into the CPU. So there was a higher voltage fed from the mainboard to the CPU and the internal voltage regulation was done on the CPU level itself. And the Alder Lake CPUs, the 12th gen Intel CPUs, are not only a hybrid when it comes to the P and E cores, but also a hybrid when it comes to the voltages. Because the 12900K also now features a fiber, 
which means that you get an additional voltage, the input voltage VCC in from the main board, which typically has a range something about 1.8 volt. This is fed to the fiber and then it's split up into the different sub voltages. For example, system agent, which is relevant for memory overclocking. So any high memory frequency would probably also require an increase of system agent voltage. Same goes to the memory controller voltage, which is typically around 1.05 volt. And then also the eCores level two cache voltage is powered by the fiber which makes it quite interesting. And there are also a ton of other voltages powered by fiber. I think there are like five or six more voltages that are present on the CPU, but none of these are relevant and none of these will help you anything for ambient overclocking. Some of them are relevant for extreme overclocking with liquid nitrogen, but for just ambient overclocking, these are the ones you should just care about. Now that we know how the voltages are supplied to the 12th gen Intel CPUs, we will look at the clocks itself. Again, very simplified, not every mainboard will be built like this, but I would say that 90% of the overclocking boards are just working like this with an external clock generator on the left, which is feeding the BCIK, the base clock of 100 megahertz to the CPU. The CPU internally, you have those multipliers, which allow to clock the different parts of the CPU, for example, the P cores, the E cores, and the ring individually. The same way we are also creating the memory clock just with different multipliers from 8 to 63 and those multipliers are then generating the memory controller clock. And now that's also something that's new on the 12th gen CPU says that we have two memory controllers. But that's also something you probably should not really care about. This slide might have more information than you actually need because especially for the memory the easiest thing about this platform is that you just go into BIOS and you set your memory frequency and you're done. And most of the time this is just very simple and it's just working out. But that's also how you're creating the memory clock on this platform. We will look at this in the BIOS now. We will start with the basic overclocking configuration in the MSI Unify X BIOS. First of all, obviously update your BIOS. If you have a different mainboard, different vendor, you will still find a BIOS update on the website of your mainboard vendor. Starting off with a p-core ratio, setting this to all core and the multiplier to 51, which instantly shows you below adjusted CPU frequency. The goal is 5100 megahertz. The e-core cannot clock as high, so we're setting this to 40, which equals an e-core clock of 4000 megahertz. CPU AVX control, we're assuming that we're only using this for gaming scenarios, gaming applications, and in some games you sometimes have AVX, but it's not running as high as using this, for example, with um, Prime95. Then we make sure that we're setting the CPU ratio offset to zero, which forces the CPU to run AVX also at 5.1 gigahertz. That's a bit more intense on the CPU, but typically if you use this for gaming, it's still fine because the load is rather low. Ring cannot clock that high, so we're starting at a ratio of 39. Now we're scrolling down to the XMP, the extreme memory profile of our memory dims. As I said before, most of the things we don't have to adjust manually. We can, however, set the memory frequency to the correct value and setting this to 5.2 in gear two. If you later, for example, want to overclock your memory dims, you can adjust the DILS value, for example, to 5400. We're skipping this for now because we want to make sure that our memory is running at a stable base for our overclocking. And we're also adjusting the CPU core voltage mode to override mode and adjust the CPU core voltage to 1.3 volt. All the other voltages you don't have to touch. Most of them really don't help anything for 24 seven overclocking. If you want to push the e-cores on the edge, this voltage might help you later, but from personal experience testing multiple CPUs, it usually does not help. One more thing is that we could now adjust the memory voltage, but since there are multiple voltages, this could be confusing for you. And we already applied the XMP, which is also then later applying those voltages automatically. So what we're doing now is that we apply this profile and then we go back into the BIOS and check out how those values changed. Already back in BIOS and you can see that the memory voltages changed to 1.25. Now we're simply also following this and add this manually. Also the VPP voltage to 1.8. If you would then try later to overclock your memories, as I said before, for example, from 5200 to 5400, you will change this to 1.35, which should be 
the first like stable range. You can try up to about 1.4 volt if you want to, but not all memory sticks will like very high voltages, so maybe try 1.35 first. Setting this back to 1.25 now. There's one more thing I want to talk about that's entering the advanced CPU configuration. There is a ton of stuff you can adjust most of the things from my perspective don't really make any sense for 24 7 overclocking for example you could disable the e-cores if you wanted to not sure why you would that you could also disable some of the p cores you could set per core hyper threading and stuff like that which is just really not relevant it's relevant for some benchmarking purposes but anything for daily i would not touch but there is something that could be interesting and there are those power limits the long short duration power limits and the current limit we can set these to the values that are already there so it's just the maximum the cpu will just go full out no limits whatsoever and that is pretty much also the stock configuration but what you could do if you have for example a weak air cooling unit and you have trouble with your temperatures because your cooling is not that great you maybe have a very tiny case and your cooling limited then you would not do a manual overclocking you would leave everything on the first page where we adjusted the clocks on auto and then you could change this value for example to 150 also change these back to auto and then if you have this on 150 then the cpu would not be able to draw more power than 150 watt on a long duration which is limiting your CPU in power draw and then also decreases the temperature. So that's something you could try if you're limited a lot in like cooling capabilities due to the case or cooler or whatever. But for our overclocking, we will just set the auto values. Now apply and go back to Windows. Now in Windows, our most important tools will be Hardware Info, Cinebench R20 and of course the CPU-C. Right click in CPU-C, visualizes the core clocks of the P cores with 5.1 GHz and 4 GHz on our E cores. If we go to memory, we can get a closer insight of the subsystem. For example, the memory clock is set to 2600, which equals the 5200 mega transfers per second for the memory sticks. The uncore frequency is also what I called the ring frequency earlier. It's also correctly set to 3900 MHz. Also the memory controller frequency is also listed here with 1300 MHz and that's half of the memory speed. Now that we are sure that everything is at least set correctly, also make sure in hardware info that you're setting the polling period in global to 500 milliseconds and press set. This is setting hardware info to refresh every half second, otherwise it's set to every two seconds, which is, I think, rather slow. And running Cinebench R20, keep an eye on the temperatures. You can see it peaks out already at 96 degrees Celsius. So it's getting really toasty. And there's not much more headroom in this configuration, at least running with a just 360 AIO. We will repeat the test. Already ran it twice for the German video. While you run it, first, obviously, check the temperatures. And secondly, also make sure that your CPU is keeping up the clock. If you're running in a temperature limit or if you're running in a power limit, for example, then you would see this on a P core frequency and also on the E core frequency. But everything is in line. One thing you should also pay attention to is also the usage. We can see right here that all the threads of P and E cores were fully utilized, so that's correct. Testing the stability of the system, you could assume to simply use Prime95, which is something we used in the previous generations quite often, not with the 11900K, but with previous gen CPUs. If you open this tool, you will or might directly notice that it's offering you to test with a number of threads of 16, while the CPU has 24 threads. However, if you want to enter 24 here, it won't allow it. So you can just do 16. But then if you would use Prime95, I neglected the configuration. But now pay attention to your thread usage. The Windows thread scheduler or the 12th gen thread scheduler on the CPU is putting the load on the e-cores to 100%. So the CPU is assuming that Prime95 is something that belongs to the background and it's utilizing the e-cores fully. I'm chic. Which is certainly nice if we wanted to test our e-cores, but since we want to test the full stability of the CPU, it doesn't really help us much because the load on the p-cores, especially if you check out the temperatures, it's not really that high. That's why I would recommend to use Intel XTU 
for stability testing of the CPU, also for fine tuning if you wanted to, but there are several different options which you could use. You could test with AVX or without. If we select the non-AVX stress test for the CPU and simply start this up, just one minute for our quick test right here. And now check it with hardware info, the CPU package power draw. It's sitting somewhere at 210 watt maybe power draw, maybe peaks out at 220. But on the right side, you could see the maximum, which we had in Cinebench R20. And that's in the region of 250 to 260, which means that running a benchmark load would be higher than using the XTU stress tool. What's quite interesting though, is if you switch to the memory stress test, so simply enable it and pay attention to the CPU package power, this puts a much higher load on your CPU, very close to our Cinebench R20 load. So that is really pushing the CPU to the max. Now we are at a point to define stability. For example, seems like Sheik is pretty unstable right now. That's usually the time, it's like 8 p.m. where Sheik is asleep. But for whatever reason, she's more like a dog and always follows where I go and then <laughs> just randomly sleeps on the table. But talking about stability, you cannot prove stability, you can only prove instability. Unstability? Instability? You know what I'm talking about. And the thing is, if you use XTU for stability testing, for example, and you use the memory test scenario, which is peaking out at like 250, 260 watt. You can run this for 48 hours and be happy that your system can run in the worst scenario, in the worst conditions for a very long time period. But then you're potentially also losing performance. Because if you go to the gaming scenario, and the gaming scenario will be a much lower load, like 130, 140 watt maybe. And in that scenario, your CPU will be much cooler and you can run a higher clock. So if you did this with like a basic uh, stability test, so for example, the non-AVX test in XTU, and you ran this for one hour, you could go back into the BIOS and simply increase the CPU core clock by one, go from 5.1 to 5.2, and then just game. Just see how it works out, if it's stable or not. Now this would be one of the possible configurations that's running the 12900K at 5.3 GHz across all of the P cores, 1.39 volt, which is a rather high voltage. But considering that it's only gaming, you can see the temperature is very low, even with AIO cooling. We're peaking out somewhere at 50 degrees Celsius because the load in gaming is typically, typically just on your GPU and not that much on a CPU. Well, depending on your game, obviously, but that is a possible configuration where you would have the highest performance. And if you run into some issues, could be a blue screen, for example, after like half an hour. If that's the case, just increase the core voltage a little bit more. Increase it to like 1.34, 1.35 volt. And because you're not running a very high load, you're not running R20 or anything, then this should be stable. And that's how you can make the most out of your CPU for gaming, because I've seen a lot of videos complaining about that you cannot really overclock the 12900K and it's running so hot. But it's just a scenario. Typically, you're just doing the, the R20 runs like when you get a CPU and when you're doing the overclock. But if you're just gaming 24 seven, then this is not relevant. Just, just use gaming as your stability test and make the most out of your CPU and get the most performance out of your CPU by also using the gaming scenario as your load test or as your stability test. That would be my recommendation. Talking about recommendations, I also prepared a small table with expected clocks and voltages for different cooling configurations. So in this table, you can see an air cooling, a 360 AIO and a castle water cooling table on the right and also the voltages below, where you can see that custom water cooling can peak out at up to 5.2 gigahertz in the worst case scenario. So everything you're seeing in this table is going by running R20 like full day, every day. And if you're just using gaming, then probably you can run 100 to 200 megahertz more than what you're seeing inside this table. But this should be a rough estimate for you, a guideline to what you can probably expect from the 12900K. We will do a more advanced video soon, like in, I don't know, three, four weeks, where we will approach a different way of overclocking the 12900K, where we're using this video as a base. Uh, if you have any more questions about how to clock the CPU, feel free to leave comments down below. Sorry, Sheik. All right, thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.